Because nowadays, Christians used to be a group of people who transformed the society. Now Christians are a group of people who conform to the society. It's time to make Christianity great again. Christians used to be people who stood up for something. Now people are wondering if Christians stand for anything. It's time to make Christianity great again. Tonight our message is called, Make Christianity Personal Again. Tonight our message is called, Make Christianity Personal Again. It was Pastor Kwabna Donko who one time said, Christianity is a personal religion, not a private religion. Christianity is a personal religion, not a private religion. Make Christianity personal again. And within this sermon, I'm going to be sharing with you all my personal story as to how I really gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am the person who I am today. Make Christianity personal again. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all that you've done for us. My prayer is that as we begin this message this evening, you speak to our hearts, you speak to our minds, you stimulate us and bring us closer to Jesus. This is our prayer in Christ's name, amen. amen. Make Christianity personal again. Now, as you all know, I'm a Christian, but specifically, I'm with the Adventist denomination of Christianity. And so let me begin my sermon by saying this. No one here can out-Adventist me. Say that again. No one here can out-Adventist me. What do I mean? Well, first of all, my father is an Adventist. And in case you didn't know, my father's father was an Adventist as well. Even until the day he died, he stayed Adventist. No one can out-Adventist me. Second of all, my mother is Adventist, and some of her siblings are Adventists as well. As I said to you before, no one can out-Adventist me. And even in fact, my entire family are Adventists. Brother is Adventist, sister is Adventist, and best of all, I am Adventist as well. In fact, I'm so Adventist that I am sure that I came out of my mother's womb singing the Pathfinder song. That's how Adventist that I am. Not only do I, she said sing it right now. <laughs> oh, we are the Pathfinder strong. Okay. Well, come on, somebody. That's, there you go. <laughs> All right. That's, that's where my knowledge of it ends, though. <laughs> so I'm that Adventist. Not only that, I know all the Adventist foods. 
If I go to an Anglo church, short term for white church, I know what type of food I'm going to eat. There's a food called haystacks, always. If I come to a Ghanaian church, ah, granted, I kind of know what food I'm going to eat. White rice with some good stew on top, and you can always get an egg on the side if you don't eat meat. Always. I know all the Adventist foods. In fact, I even know all the Adventist tricks. I remember when we were younger, you know, of course, Adventists, we don't wear jewelry. And so if we want to go outside, you know, what we will do is that we'll get those magnet earrings. Yes. <laughs> you see, that's why the youth are laughing. They know. You get the magnet earrings, put them on. Then when you're coming home, take them right off. Hey, man, nobody will ever know. You know, the Adventist. Man, I even know, man, back in the day, sometimes some people will come to church, no jewelry, then go to the bank or whatever, jewelry on. If they see an elder, then they'll be like, oh, man, like this. I literally saw one lady go like that. I know all the Adventist tricks. I know all the Adventist songs. Yeah, Namri Kosion. Uh-huh. Nyan Kenyami or whatever. How you say that in tree? You know what? <laughs> Come on, y'all. I know the Adventist songs, man. Oh, man. And even in fact, I'm so Adventist that I never watched a TV show on Saturday, even though you know that all the best TV shows premiere on Friday night. <laughs> never did. And I'm so Adventist, I don't know if you guys will believe this, but I'm so Adventist that I've never even drank a Coke or Pepsi in my life. <laughs> because that's caffeine. Now, I'm transitioning. I'm transitioning in the story. Now, don't get me wrong. Mentally speaking, come on, y'all, don't miss this part, though. Don't get me wrong. Mentally, oh, that's me. I, you look, that's Adventist clothes. Look. <laughs> Adventist clothes. Look, my mother dressed me. Adventist clothes. Come on, y'all, stick with me. Now, don't get me wrong. Mentally speaking, I understood what I was doing. Don't get me wrong. However, emotionally speaking, I was, pract I was not practicing my faith because I had a personal encounter with Jesus myself. No, that's not why I was practicing my faith. I was practicing my faith. Don't miss this, people. Don't miss this part. I was practicing my faith because the people around me, like my parents, the people around me, like my youth leaders, the people around me, like my spiritual role models, they had a personal encounter with Jesus. And I was practicing my faith because they had a personal encounter with Jesus and they were telling me to do so. And so you can really say that I had faith, but it wasn't a personal faith. Instead, it was a borrowed faith. Is everyone following me? It was a borrowed faith because I wasn't practicing my faith because I knew Jesus for myself. I was practicing my faith because people around me who knew Jesus were telling me to practice my faith. And so stick with me, everyone. Because I had a borrowed faith, not a personal faith, I went to church on Sabbath, sure, but I also snuck out of church on Sabbath to play basketball. I had a borrowed faith, not a personal faith. Some of you can probably relate to my experience. Can you? Well, hear what I'm about to say. You are practicing your faith, right? You're probably singing in the youth choir, practicing your faith. You are probably attending church every Saturday, practicing your faith. You're probably even serving others, practicing your faith. Maybe you're serving in the children's ministry. Maybe it's Pathfinders. And mentally speaking, you understand what you're doing. But emotionally speaking, you are not practicing because you had a personal encounter with Jesus. You're only practicing because your parents told you to do so. Your youth leader told you to do so. Your pastor told you to do so, or even an evangelist like me told you to do so. You have a borrowed faith. But today, here is the main point of my message. The main point of my message is this. If we're going to make Christianity great again, you have to make a transition. You have to make a what, everyone? No, no, no. You have to make a what, everyone? And you have to make a transition from having a 
borrowed faith to having a what, everyone? Personal faith. No, no, y'all are not with me. Let's say that again. If we're going to make Christianity great again, you're going to have to make a transition from having a what type of faith? A? No, no, come on. I need everyone. That was someone. I need A? And you have to make that transition to A? That's when we can make Christianity great again. With that being said, turn your Bibles to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we encounter a lady. And this lady is going to teach us something about faith transitions. John chapter 4. Let's look at it. In John chapter 4, Jesus has an encounter with a woman from Samaria. Does everyone know this story? Sure, I know you do. Now, within this encounter, she got to a point where Jesus told her everything about her life especially things that she thought other people didn't know. And so she ran out to the people in the community and she said, come and see a man who has told me everything that I have ever done. And then she says, John 4 verse 32, she says, could this be the Messiah? She was convinced. Now everyone watch the story carefully. Now the Bible says, don't miss it now, this one is good, it's really good. The Bible says, that, watch this now, this is, this is, see this, come on y'all, don't miss this. This is, this is gold, this is good stuff I'm teaching you. The Bible says that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus, but why did they believe in Jesus? Because of the woman's testimony. Pause right there. The Bible says that many of the people of Samaria believed in Jesus. This means they had faith, true or false. Oh, no, no, come on, y'all. Are you sleeping? Come on, stick with me. The, pe the, pe the Bible says the many of the Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus. This means they had faith. True or false, everyone? Yeah. But here's the question. Why did they have that faith? The Bible says they had that faith because of the woman's what, everyone? Testimony. So this means that they had faith. But they weren't practicing their faith because they had their own encounter with Jesus. But they were practicing their faith because the woman had an encounter with Jesus. And the woman told them about Jesus. Do you see what's taking place? And so effectively, you can say that the people of Samaria had a what type of faith? Everyone, a borrowed faith. Is everyone watching me now? Stick with me. I'm going somewhere. But the story does not end here. The Bible says in John chapter 4, verses 40 through 41... It says, then the Samaritans came to Jesus. Don't miss that phrase. I'm going to come back to it later in the sermon. And it says, they urged him. I'm going to come back to that phrase too. To stay with them. And Jesus stayed for how many days, church? Two days. Okay. Don't miss what's about to happen here. It's gold. Watch it. Then in verses 40 and 41, the Bible says, because of Jesus' words, many more became believers. Check it now. This is the part I want you to see. Now, as more of the Samaritans became believers, the Bible says the Samaritans approached the woman who had first evangelized to them. And when they approached that woman, these are the words they said to that woman. I love it. It's like gold. They said, we no longer believe in Jesus or in him just because of what you have said. Oh, man, you guys are not following the story. Remember, some of you are only practicing faith because of what your parents have said. Some of you are only practicing faith because of what the evangelist has said. Some of you are only practicing faith because of what the pastor has said. But notice what they said. They said, we no longer believe him just because of what you have said. There was nothing wrong with what she said. But they said, our faith is not going to remain with what you said. But they said, now we have heard for who? Ourselves. And we really know that this man is the savior of the world. This teaches me that all of a sudden, these individuals no longer have a borrowed faith, but they made a transition and now they have a what type of faith, everyone? Personal faith. And at this moment, I'm going to share you my story of how I move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith. And I'm going to encourage you to do the same in your life. So, where did my journey begin? Let me make sure I get my notes so I don't get it wrong. Now, don't, don't be going out repeating my story, all right? So, I told you guys that no one can out-adventist me. However, growing up, I had a borrowed faith. I didn't have a personal faith. 
It was not until junior year of high school that everything changed. Question, Quedro, how did everything change? It all started when I was talking to a girl. That's how the good stories start, when you talk to a girl. Now this girl, this girl wasn't a, a Ghanaian girl. Don't, don't kill me, where's Auntie Ivy's wife? Hey, don't kill me. She was Nigerian. Hey, <laughs> Come on, y'all. That's the Alatas, the Alatas, man, the Alatas, man. Man, awesome person. And now, this is what happened. So in the summertime, a friend of mine gets an internship to go to a certain school. I'll leave, I'll leave it nameless. So the person goes over to the school, and at first, man, the communication is good. She's texting me. I'm texting her. She's updating me. I'm updating her. She's saying, Kojo, I love you. I'm saying, I'm getting there. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, there was a transition. So things started to change. Now I'm texting. The reply is coming one day late. Ah. I'm calling. Now she has too much schoolwork to do. All right. Then, I'm asking for updates. She says, everything is all right. I said, no, when a girl says everything is all right, that's how everything is wrong. <laughs> so one day, man, one day she sent me a text message. Now, I'll never forget these words. Memorable words. Dreadful words. <laughs> words that you never want to hear. Unfortunately, words that most of you have probably either said to someone or you've had it said to you. She said, Kojo, we need to talk. Oh, 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 oh. I, I still feel it in my chest. Kojo, we need to talk. I'm like, girl, what we need to talk about now? I ain't got not, nothing to say to you. So we set the date and I call. And this is how she let me down. She came up with an analogy. Now, if you want to break up with someone, come up with an analogy. Came up with an analogy of an old shoe and a new shoe. All right, here, here, here. So she said, Kojo, you know, sometimes in life you have old shoes. There's nothing wrong with an old shoe. The, problem, the thing is that you just want something new. There's nothing wrong with the old. So I'm, I'm following, I'm following. Now you know, sometimes when you give someone an, an analogy, you just leave it for them to make the implication. No, not her. <laughs> Kojo, you're that old shoe. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, I'm like, Father, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> he said, you're that old shoe. And I just want something new. I remember I hung up the phone that day. I'm a Ghanaian man, so I don't cry. <laughs> so I put my head on the bed, and I don't know what you want to call that. <laughs> but it was terrible. Heartbroken, felt devalued, totally depressed. I was listening to every R&B song to try and pick up my spirits. <laughs> and none of them worked. And I remember at that time, I'm talking about transitions. I remember at that time, because I was no longer speaking with her on a consistent basis, what happened is that I realized that I had more available time to myself. And so because I had more available time to myself, I remember one day I was just there and the thought hit my mind. The thought said, Kojo, Pick up a book and read it. And so, you know, my father's scholar number one. So I went through all his books 
And I just found a book over there. It said the story of Christianity. I don't know why I picked up that book, but this is how you know God is working on you. First of all, the book had a terrible cover. I've never seen something that bad. This is a blue cover. Nobody would ever be attracted to it. But for some reason, I decided to pick it up that day. And I picked up the book, and I remember the first pages of that book said, your purpose in life is to know God. And I remember this was the first time I ever heard, at that time I didn't know it was the voice of God, but I just heard a powerful voice speak to my heart. And the voice said this, Kojo, your purpose in life is not to be in a relationship with this girl. Your purpose in life is to know me. Those words did something to my heart. And ever since that day, I remember I had a hunger and a passion to get to know God even more. And so I started listening to every sermon I could listen to. I started reading every book I could read. I remember I started uh, talking to as many people as I can about God. And then all of a sudden, in 2011, I got my chance to go on my first missionary trip with my dad. I never forget it. I went to Ghana. And when I came back from Ghana, I was so passionate and so on fire for God and I remember I, I was on my bed just relaxing. And while I was on my bed relaxing, for the second time in my life, I heard the voice of God. But this one, it was dreadful. And it came to me quick, fast, piercing, almost like lightning, caught me by surprise, and it made me shook. The words that I heard quickly were, Kojo, you are lost. I said, no, I'm just, my mind is playing tricks on me. The thought hit me harder. Kojo, you're lost. I said, no, no, my man. He said, Kojo, you're lost. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, so I engaged the voice. I said, why? He said, you're lost because you're preaching, you're reading your Bible, but you know in your heart you don't have a real relationship with me. I remember when I heard those words, fear came within my heart. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, what then do I do? And my mind went to a Bible verse that said, get on your knees and repent. And so I remember I got off my bed. This was in my room in, 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 in New York. And I bowed on my knees and I said, for the first time in my life, without anyone forcing me, without anyone coercing me, and I said, God, for real, for real, for the first time, I want to surrender all of my life to you. Amen. I remember I got up off my knees and I felt a peace so strong and I remember the feeling that I felt. Don't, 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 don't miss it. This one is good. It was as if at that moment God was saying to me, Kojo, you are fully known by me. But even though you are fully known by me, you are also fully loved by me. No, come on. Y'all don't know the meaning of those words. Just a couple of months ago, some girl had called me an old shoe. Just a couple of months ago, some girl has shot down my valley. Just a couple of months ago, some person has shot down my esteem. Just a couple of months ago, some person had told me I was not worth it. But now God was telling me that even though I fully know you, with all of your flaws, I fully know you. With all of your mistakes, I fully know you. With all of your shortcomings, I fully know you. But even though I fully know you, I fully love you. Amen. And that love is burning in me even until this day. And so if any of you came to me, I can say with the confidence and boldness in my heart that I am not practicing my faith because my father is a preacher. And I'm not practicing my faith because my mother is a godly woman. And I'm not practicing my faith because my brother is a passionate man. I am practicing my faith because Jesus told me that I am fully known, but I am also fully loved. And I am with Jesus, not because someone has told me to be with Jesus, but because I have had my personal encounter with Jesus. Have you had yours? It's time to make Christianity personal again. Now, for some of you, you're sitting here, you're wondering, Pastor, these are great words. How can I also have a personal, personal encounter with the Lord? How can I move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you four ways very quickly. First way is this. If you're going to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith, the first thing that I will say to you is don't get stuck on the bridge. Pastor, what do you mean? Let me explain. Come on, y'all. What city is that? You guys know what city it is. That's the city that I love, New York City. 
Y'all know what bridge that is? Yeah, me neither. I don't know, but it's all right. So, in New York City, we always went on a bridge. Now, what was the purpose of the bridge? The purpose of the bridge was to take you from your location to your destination. You need that bridge. You want that bridge. But the key is that you can't get stuck on that bridge. Because the purpose of the bridge is not to get stuck on a bridge. The purpose of the bridge is to go through a bridge to the destination. Y'all are following me, yes or no? In the same sort of way, borrowed faith is like a bridge. When you, you see, it's not, it's not a bad thing to have borrowed faith in the beginning. It wasn't a bad thing that the Samaritans believed because of the woman. It wasn't a bad thing that I learned about Jesus from my mother. It's not a bad thing to learn about Jesus from the pastor. It's not a bad thing. The bridge is okay. The problem is when you forget the purpose of that bridge. The purpose of that bridge is not to get stuck on that bridge. The purpose of that bridge is to go through that bridge to the destination. Are you guys following me, yes or no? And this is what I want to say to you. If you're going to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith, faith, don't get stuck on the bridge. Don't get stuck on the bridge. And let me tell you why you can't get stuck on the bridge. Come on, I'm going to make a good point here. The reason why you can't get stuck on the bridge, and this has happened to a lot of my friends. I have a lot of my friends who are in the church, but now they have left the church. Do you know why they left the church? They got stuck on the bridge. Let me tell you what happened. You see, when you have borrowed faith, stick with me, y'all. When you have borrowed faith, at a certain point in your life, your borrowed faith will get tested. Yeah? Guess where it will get tested? It may get tested by a life experience. Someone close to you might die. Or it get, may get tested when you go off to college. A professor may, 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 may ask you a powerful question. Or it may get tested when you engage in a heartbreak. Your whole world may feel like it's shattering. And when it gets tested, hear me y'all, when it gets tested, if you had borrowed faith, borrowed faith can't stand the test. And so many of my friends who had borrowed faith, they got tested, and because they had borrowed faith and not personal faith, their borrowed faith turned into no faith at all. But you are going to make that transition so that when your faith gets tested, you can say that I need no other evidence, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. You can say that my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly need on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. But you can only say that when you have a personal faith. If that's good. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Come on, y'all. Don't sleep on me. I've only talked for 30 minutes. I got literally 10 left. Come on, y'all. If you're going to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith, the second thing you have to do, don't miss it. The second thing you have to do is that you have to take the what, everyone, initiative. So I remember when I, when, I, when, I, when I had my own encounter with Jesus, remember I had a friend of mine in New York. And this is what my friend said to me. He said, Kojo, you see, the reason why you have a strong faith is because you've had a personal encounter with Christ. I haven't had that encounter yet, so I'm waiting for it. And after I get that encounter, I'll become like you. That's what my friend said to me. And now here's the, the crazy thing. I've preached all across the United States, and young people in the United States always say this to me. Oh, I haven't had my experience with God yet, but as soon as I have it, I'll become serious like you. Do you know what the problem with that mindset is? You have a passive approach, not an active approach. If you're going to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith, you can't wait for a personal faith to come to you. You have to take the initiative to go to it. Okay, maybe you don't believe me. Let me show you evidence from the text. The Bible says, then the Samaritan did what? Came to Jesus. Ah, uh, watch. Scripture didn't say Jesus came to the Samaritans. Instead, Scripture says the Samaritans took the initiative and went to who, everyone? Jesus. And because they took the initiative, they were rewarded for their initiative. And guys, I'm working. I'm working today, guys. Are you guys hearing now? I'm working today. All right, all right. So second thing, if you're going to... If you're, going to, if you're going to move from borrowed faith to personal faith, you have to do what, everyone? Take the? Oh, man, that's someone. I need everyone. You have to take the? Let me give you the third one. If you're going to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith, remember the Eric Thomas principle. Oh, question, preacher. What is that? Let me help you. So, 
Eric Thomas is a motivational speaker. And one time he told a story. Some of you know this story. Some of you don't, so I'll share it again. He told a story of a boy who wanted to be successful. And so the boy wanted to be successful, so guess what he decided to do? He decided to go to a guru so that the guru will help him be successful. So let me, let me just get a young boy like him. Yeah, yeah come on. You were a good deacon today. What's your name, my brother? Michael. 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 Come up here, Michael. So a boy like Michael came to a guru. And Michael said, I want to be successful. So the guru looked at Michael and said, Mike, you want to be successful? Say yes. Okay, good, good. You want to be successful? He's like, yeah, I want to make big money. Say you want to make big money. Big money. All right. Say, yeah. Uh, what else do you want? Say you want a big house. All right, good. Speak it into existence. So Michael wants to be success. And so the guru said, okay, if you want to be successful, come out with me tomorrow morning, and I'll show you how to be successful. And so he slept. The next morning, he came out in his bow tie. My shen is soup. Come on. <laughs> brought him out. And when he brought him out, he took him to an ocean. He took his head and he pushed it under the water. One, two, three, four, and all of a sudden the boy, boy started going like this. Boy started going like this. Boy started going like this. And then he released his hand and boy pop, pop, boy pop, out of, out of the water, looking traumatized. The guru looked at the boy and asked the boy a question. He says, son, when you were in that water, what were you thinking about? Boy said, <laughs> Boy said, I wanted, to, I wanted to breathe. And the guru looked at him and said, were you thinking about playing basketball? No. Were you thinking about sleeping? No. Were you thinking about eating food? No. Were you thinking about anything else? No. What were you thinking about? I was thinking about one thing and one thing alone. I needed to breathe. And the guru looked at the young boy and said, you will only be successful when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe. Stick with me, y'all. In the same sort of way, you can only move from borrowed faith to personal faith if you want that personal faith as bad as you want to breathe. You can't get personal faith being haphazard in your seeking of God. You can't get your personal faith being lazy in your seeking of God. You must want it as bad as you want to breathe. Michael Polite would always say, we don't need people who are more disciplined. Stick with me, y'all. We need people who are more desperate. Oh, man, y'all not following me today. Come on, y'all. You know what it means to be desperate? If you, I got to throw you under the bus. If you, if, if, if you is always asking for money. She be killing me. Thank you, my, Michael. If you be killing me. She be like, Kajo, $725. I'm trying to watch the movie. Send me $25. Now, here's what I do with a fear. Like, first, I'll be like, no, I'm not giving you no money. Ha, ah, so I think I can shake off the lady. No, sir. Kajo! I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, nah, I don't got no money for you. All right, ten dollars. Nah, I don't got ten dollars. Kajo! Hold on, hold on, stick with me, y'all. At the end of the day, though, she got her twenty-five dollars. Why? Because she was desperate for it. She fought for it, and because she fought for it, she got it. And in the same sort of way, if you are not desperate, desperate. You can't make that transition. Okay, you all don't believe me. You think I'm preaching righteousness by works. Look at it, everyone. John chapter 4, verse 41 says, the Samaritans, look at the text, everyone. It says they, oh, no, no, y'all getting quiet on me now. It says they did what, everyone? They, oh, okay, maybe the word urge is too big of a broad foot for you. Let me give you another one. The Bible says they literally did what, everyone? Ah, come on, y'all. They begged. Okay, maybe the brothel is not clicking over there. This is according to the Greek text, the original construction. Look, the Bible says they kept pleading. These are not people who are haphazard. These are people who are desperate. They wanted that personal faith with Christ. And if you are going to have a personal faith with Christ too, remember the Eric Thomas principle. 
be desperate. Now, here, I'm not preaching righteousness by works. I'm not preaching righteousness by works. Because hear me, hear me, hear me. You would realize that when you are seeking God, the only reason why you're able to seek God is because already God has already been seeking you. And the strength to seek him has already come from him. Had it not come from him, you would never even have a desire to be with him. Come on, y'all. So I'm not preaching righteousness by works. It's righteousness by faith. If in case you don't believe me, let me put some scripture. Je Jeremiah 29, 11. You will seek me and you will find me when you do it with some of your heart. No. Uh, when you do it with most of your heart. Uh, when you do it with 95% of your heart. No, with all of your heart. With all of your heart. Last but not least, I'm closing on this, y'all. If you're going to have a personal faith, take a risk on Jesus. Take a risk on Jesus. Why do I say that? Look at the text again. John 40. John 4, verse 40 to 41. Text says, the Samaritans came to him, urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. I'm working on that word, stay. You all know that according to history, Samaritans and Jews didn't bang with each other. They didn't get along with each other. Right? True or false, everyone? True. And so for the fact that the Samaritans were allowing a Jew to stay means that they were willing to take a what, everyone? A risk. And in the same sort of way, if you want to be able to move from that borrowed faith to a personal faith, you have to be willing to also take a risk as well. Let me illustrate why you have to be able to take a risk. And I'll close on this. Maybe, Kofi, if you can play something light on the piano, that would be great. There was, there was a man who was about to get in his car and drive. So a man got in his car. Now this man had what I call a need for speed. Come on, any, any people in here who have a need for speed? All right, you don't have to admit it. I can't lie, I'm one of those people. So because I keep getting stopped by cops. But no speeding tickets. Praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. They only give me warnings out here. So now this guy got on his car and... Mm. Got his car ready. And then changed the gear and... Pedal to the metal. Vroom, started driving off. Ding! Driving, 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 driving on the highway. And as the man was driving on the highway, all of a sudden, the man in the car, don't miss it, the man in the car saw a fellow standing in the middle of the street. The fellow wasn't standing there passively. He was standing there and he was waving his hands. Guy in the car got confused. Road rage filled his heart. What the hell are you doing there? That he was saying that in the car. Get the hell out the way. Guy was still there, waving his hands, waving his hands, waving his hands. The man in the car said, well, I'm about to kill this guy. He said, okay, okay, what I'll do is that I will swerve left. So at least if I swerve left, I can get around him. So the man in the car swerves left. And the man who was waving, also moves to that direction as well, waving his hand. Guy says, this dude is crazy. So he said, let me swerve right. Swerves right. Man who's waving his hand also moves to the right. He said, oh boy, this is it. He gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And all of a sudden, before he reaches the man, he puts his foot on the ground and screech, stops. The man who's waving his hands runs to the windshield of the car and the man in the car is enraged he looks at the man who's waving his hands and says what is wrong with you you are serving as an obstacle in my path get out my way or else i'll have to knock you over the man who was waving his hands says sir i'm so sorry to be an obstacle to you but the reason why i was waving my hands is that the government forgot to put up signs if you kept going at the speed at which you were going, the road ends, and all that's left over there is a cliff. You would have driven your car right off that cliff. So I was waving my hands in order to save you. Stick with me, y'all. I'm bringing it home. In the same sort of way, Jesus will become an obstacle in your life in order to save you from eternal damnation. And that's 
why you need to take a risk on Jesus. So that he will serve as an obstacle to your wicked heart. Your wicked heart which is heading towards the path of destruction. He will serve as an obstacle to it. When you're tempted to watch that pornography, Jesus will become your obstacle. When you're tempted to start skipping out on your devotion, Jesus will become that obstacle. When you're tempted to cheat on your spouse, Jesus will become that obstacle. When you are tempted to live outside of the will of God, Jesus will become your obstacle. That's why you need to take a risk on him. And as he becomes your obstacle, he's really not your obstacle because he's really just setting you on that better road to eternal life. And when you accept him into your life, then you will be able to say like the Samaritans, we know, ah, not that we have heard, but now we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Ah, uh -uh, you will be able to say, ah, now I know that this man is really the savior of my life. Who wants a personal faith? Do you want a personal faith? You want, uh, you want to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith? If that's you. This is one of the most important sermons that I ever preached to young people. Because the attrition rate is high. Many people are leaving the church. The way to cure that is to make this transition. So I have a very specific appeal today. No, 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 this one is very specific. Very specific. Now I want to make an appeal to some young person who's here. Don't worry about someone judging you. We're not here to judge. That's why I told my story. So that we will understand that this is a hospital for sinners, not a sanctum for the saints. If you feel like your faith so far has been a borrowed faith, and today you want to start a journey of moving from a borrowed faith to a personal faith. If that's you, I invite you to just take a stand where you are. I'm making a specific appeal to some young person who is here. You feel like you have been living on a borrowed faith. Don't forget, there's nothing wrong with a borrowed faith. But you want to make a transition from living a borrowed faith to a personal faith. I want to invite you, wherever you are, to just take that stand. Don't be afraid. I want to pray for you. I'm going to join you wherever you are. You want to move from, God bless you, my sister. You want to move from a borrowed faith. Come here, God. God bless you. Come on. You want to move from a borrowed faith to a person. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Borrowed faith. You know you have a borrowed faith. And you want to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith. Well, you're not just practicing religion because a preacher told you to practice religion. And you're not just practicing religion because someone encouraged you to practice religion. You're practicing religion because you're experiencing Jesus. Come on, don't, don't be afraid. Some young person who wants to make that transition. Be brave, be bold like these young women here. You want to be able to make that transition. I'm, I'm inviting you to the front right now. God bless you, my sister. Come on, don't be afraid. Come on, young man. It's never too early to practice faith. Come on, come on. You want to make that transition from borrowed faith. This is not a baptism call. This is just a call to start a new journey from borrowed faith to personal faith. Now, where are my men? Come on, God bless you. God bless you, young lady. Come on, God bless you too. This is specifically for the young people right now. You want to make a transition from borrowed faith to personal faith. God bless you too. Borrow faith to personal faith. Come on, y'all. You want to make that transition in your life. I'm inviting you at this moment. So I want to pray for you. I want to get you started on this journey. If you know the song, you can join in with Jeff Dar. My humble cry. While on others. Why? God bless you, my sister. Anyone else? You want to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith? You're only practicing religion because your father told you to practice religion. Or you're only practicing religion, God bless you. That's my first young man that's coming up. God bless you. God bless you, the young man. Come on, y'all. You want to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to move from a borrowed faith to a personal faith. Now, you don't even have to come up because I'm telling you to come up. The only reason why I'm pushing my appeal is because sometimes I know we need a little more encouragement. 
So if you need a little more encouragement, that's why I'm giving you this chance. We're going to pray solemn prayers. Lord, don't pass us by. God bless you, young man. Come on, y'all. It's never too early to practice faith. Spirit of God is here. Spirit of God is here. Spirit of God is here. Spirit of God is here and speaking to some somebody, somebody, telling somebody that you are living a life sometimes even of no faith. And you just need to get a faith journey started. If God is talking to you, if God is speaking to you, this is your chance. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Take a public stand for him. And in the places where it matters, he will take a public stand for you. God bless you. Do not pass. Jeff, I help us one more time with the car, Savior. Uh. Mm. Everyone else who's in the audience, I would like you to stand in solidarity with these individuals. Stand right where you are, please. Hear my humble cry. person who is here, I'd like you to get on your knees right here, please. We're going to pray, pray, pray for you. I'm going to invite Andy to come to the front, please. I know you have a personal faith, and so I want you to pray for the individuals who are here. Everyone else who is in the audience, this, this is biblical. Don't be afraid. This is biblical. In the Bible, when you're trying to transfer or when you want a person to receive the Holy Spirit, what the apostles, come on, we're making Christianity great again. What the apostles used to do is that they used to lay hands on the person. And in laying hands on the person, what would happen is that if the person's heart was correct, what would happen is that that would be a way that the person would receive the Holy Spirit. Now, because all of us can't lay hands on these individuals right here, if you have the strength to, I'd like you to just raise your right hand and raise it forward. This is biblical. You take your right hand and raise it forward. And that is standing as a symbol as you laying hands on these individuals over here. Because through solidarity, God will answer these sort of prayers. And so wherever you are, you're just going to take your right hand and you're going to hand it forward. And this is a form of laying hands. This is biblical. Don't be afraid. We're making Christianity great again. At this moment, what you're going to do, keep your hands raised. Remember, when Moses, when the Israelites were fighting, <laughs> Moses kept his hands up. And that's how the Israelites kept winning. Keep your hands up. And as you do, we're going to say a prayer for them. Andy, you'll be first. I'll be second. We're making Christianity great again, starting right here in Columbus. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our most gracious Father God, we are so thankful for this message this afternoon. And Lord, Savior, Jesus, we thank you for the God that you are. Yes. That you use your people, you use your own children mm. to speak to us and to change our hearts and our minds. Lord, this message this afternoon, this evening was so clear. Everybody in this room have heard the message. It has touched the heart of many, but some are still not deciding to come mm, up. My Lord, mercy. Lord, we know that everybody's time is different. Mm, that's right. But for those that are here kneeling before you, Lord, I pray for special strength and mm. power from yes, above. Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. That you may touch each individual yes, kneeling God. before you mm. this afternoon. Yes, God. Each one of your children kneeling before you, Lord. That you may give them the faith that you gave to Abraham. Yes. You may give them the integrity that you gave to Daniel. And Lord, you may give them the wisdom from above that you gave to Solomon. Mm so that they may go out in the world and show the Jesus that they know. But mostly, Lord, change their hearts and their minds. Yes, Lord. So that they may stand for you wherever they go. Yes, Lord. In their homes, may they be a light for their siblings and their parents even, if possible. Mm. In their schools, may they be a light for their classmates and their teachers. Mm. In their sports teams, wherever they go, Lord, May they shine for your glory. May they show the example of a true Christian. Mm. But without you, Lord, they can't do any of these. Mm. 
So I pray for your Holy Spirit to descend in this room. Yes, Lord. This evening, Lord, that it may touch each of our hearts, that we may leave this room changed for the better to be more like you. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, when you return on that great day, Lord, we may be among the saved so we can go to heaven and spend eternity with you. Yes, Lord. Lord, please be with us. May this message not be like every other message that we hear every Sabbath. Mm. We hear the message, we leave, and we come back the same. But today, may this message change our hearts. Yes, Lord. May it change our minds. And mostly, Lord, may it change our souls. That's right. We ask you all of this, Lord, in your precious name. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All of you, God bless you so much. If any of you want to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, you can talk to me, you can talk to Andy, you can talk to Kofi. Thank you all for coming tonight. I don't know if there's any last announcement left. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate that, man. I am alone. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Give me 